Thank you very much. Um, and great to see so many of my students out here too. So uh, welcome to everybody for coming. All right, great. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk about the horse health check. And anyone who knows me uh, knows this is one of my platforms, my soapbox, if you will, um, because I strongly support health, welfare, and safety of horses and the people who work with them. And one of our challenges is knowing when a horse is actually sick. And so what I want to do today is to challenge you a bit, um, make you think, take a, a time to reflect on your own practices, and I'd like to see if I can't push you to move to a higher level in terms of looking at horse health, all right? So there's several levels of horse health that I look at when we're talking about it. There's the ADR method, there's the EDPP method, there is the TPR method, and then there's the HHC. Now, anyone know what the ADR method of assessing horse health is? Ain't doing right. So you walk into the barn and you just look and it's like, eh, you ain't doing right and you know, something's wrong, but that's sort of where it stops. So I want to move you up a little higher level. So then we go to the EDPP level. Anyone know what that might stand for? All right, yay, all right. So yes, eating, drinking, peeing and pooping is the EDPP level of assessing whether your horse is doing all right. And obviously we know if your horse isn't eating, isn't drinking, isn't peeing, or isn't pooping, if he's not in trouble now, he soon will be, all right? So the next level though, that doesn't tell you much. Again, you're not really moving a whole lot better than the ADR method. So we wanna go up to the next one. We have TPRs. Now I know some of you have been trained on this level. TPR stands for? Temperature, pulse, and respiration. How many do that with your horses right now? if the ADR method is, so you walk in and ADR and now we do the TPRs, right? Okay, that's good, so that's a good step forward. But now I wanna teach you one more level because part of the problem with horses is they are prey animals. The last thing that you will do if you're a horse is put a blazing neon sign on your butt that says, I'm hurt, I'm sick, come eat me. So horses have learned to hide this and they are masters at hiding pain. And there's brand new research out there that I encourage you to look in recognizing pain in horses because I can tell you folks, we suck. And no offense if any vets are in the room, but they suck too, all right? The research has shown that we are not good at picking up pain and distress in horses. So here's the way that we can help, help our horses and help support health and welfare by doing the horse health check. So for any of you who thought you're going to just sit here and do nothing, um, you're in trouble. Okay, why is this? There we go. All right, so the horse health check. Um, I consider this a very important tool for every horse owner out there so that you can actually very quickly look at your horse and not only know that he ain't, de ain't doing right, but now you can start to pinpoint that and work closer with your vet as a professional so that you can pass along important information. So the horse health check ideally should be part of your daily routine, but it's not part of mine. I recognize that. We don't have time every single day. But if you walk into your barn and the horse ain't doing right, then you go to the next step, which is the horse health check. So let's learn how we do that. All right. So there's actually two ways that we're going to do that. So essentially, if the horse is in the stall or if you have them in the cross ties in the aisle, th those are perf for perfect areas. Um, so first of all, you want to do just a general look on the horse. So we want to look at the general condition and attitude. Is the horse over or underweight? And I encourage everybody to learn how to do proper body condition scoring, all right? because that's another part of the tool. It, look at the hair coat. Is it got some shine on it or is it, is it dull? Uh, is the horse alert, looking around, or is it feeling a little bit lethargic? Um, and then you observe the, the rest of the health check parameters. The second part of this is looking at the horse in motion. So now we want to watch this horse trot out and trot back, and we'll show you um, some videos on, on this so that uh, it can help train your eyes as to what we're looking at. All right, so let's go into... All right, so first of all, the eyes of the horse are the largest eye of any land mammal. 
And we know through evolution and physiology that the body only supports that which is useful. So the horse having this giant eye and maintaining giant eyes in all equid species, we know is important. They live by looking around. So they talk about the eye being the window to the soul. The eye can be the window to the health status of your horse. And that's one of the things that you should learn to look at is the eye of the horse. Because when that eye starts to get that fixed stare or glassy stare, we've all had that deer in the headlight look, right? So horses will get like that too when they're not feeling well. And it's sometimes one of the first things that you can pick up when you walk in the barn. Horse is hanging his head over the, the side of the, the gate and you can just see in the eye once you start learning and training your eye to do this. So it should be bright and clear, it should be looking around because those eyes are really, really important to the horse as a prey animal. So if that horse is not looking around and not paying attention to its environment, there's something wrong, right? As a prey animal, he lives to look around and look for the prey, right? So those eyes are really important and they can tell you a lot. Anyone have a friend with migraines? So you know, as the migraine is coming on, the eyes change, right? And I can pick that up in my friends and they can pick it up in me because I get migraines as well. But you can see it in somebody's eyes when the migraine is starting to come. You can do the same thing in horses, right? So it should be bright and alert, should be attentive to its environment. And if it's a glassy or sunken stare, um, that's not a good thing. Um, sorry, I skipped one thing. You'll notice on each of these, I've got writing in green, yellow, and red. So obviously the green means everything's good. Yellow is careful, something's not quite right. And the red obviously is the, the bell ringer, talk to the vet. Um, all right, so that helps you sort of um, go through that. So the next thing is let's talk about mucous membranes. Mucous membranes on yourself or your horse is that tissue that's up above your teeth. And if you know the person next to you, you can do this with them, otherwise I won't recommend it. <laughs> but what you need to do with the horse or your friend is lift up the lip and take a look at those mucous membranes. And they should be pink and they should be moist. When horses start to have problems, you will see they start to get a pale, so now it's a pale pink, and they'll actually be a bit tacky. So you know how it's like in your mouth when you're dehydrated? and it's a bit tacky, same thing with the horse. All right? If they are ever dry, if they're ever purplish, if they're ever bluish, or if you lift the lip and you see a red line right at the top of their teeth on the gum, those are all bell ringer situations. You need to talk to a veterinarian. What that is can be a lot of different things, but it's a problem. All right? So what I'm doing with this horse health check is teaching you to know what's normal, so that you can very quickly pick up what's abnormal. All right, so those are all different abnormal things. Now, the next thing is cap refill. Um, anyone ever had a cast on your foot? No one here? Oh, come on, you're horse people. You've all had a cast on your leg. <laughs> all right, if you've ever had a cast on your leg and you go to the doctor, one of the first things the doc will do is pinch your toes. And the doctor is looking for capillary refill, circulation, because we know if that cast gets too tight, it blocks off the circulation to the toes. So one of the things that we do with horses is capillary refill. And so what we actually do there is, sorry, let me just back up because that, oh, come on here. We just did it on that uh, video here. Let's do that again. Cap refill. There. Oh, my video's not working there. Okay, I apologize for that. There's supposed to be a video that works there. Um, so you can do this to yourself again. You take your finger, and I want you to put your thumb up, if, and take a look at your thumbnail, and you're going to take your thumb and your finger of your other hand, and you're going to press on the nail and tell me what happens to the color. It goes white. Okay, you've pressed all the blood out. Now, press it, make it white, and then let go, and count how long it takes for it to, for the color to come back in. Can you count? Two seconds, you're in trouble. All right. So it should come right back, right? So if you're seeing that, the moment you take your, your thumb off 
um, that color should just flood right back in. And that's telling about the blood pressure in the body. So that's what we do with the horse, is we actually press our thumb on the gum right above the, the teeth. You press it, let it go, and then you watch how quickly it goes back. And it should snap back. You shouldn't be able to count. That's normal. If you do that, though, and if any of you are at the Saugeen campground, this is a good tool for you to learn because if you're overriding your horse or if it's too hot for the day, all right, if you press on that gum and it takes 1,001, 1,002, and now the color's coming back in, that's a potential problem. There's something going on. All right? If you can go have coffee before you see the blood come back in, um, you're in real trouble. Right? because that's blood pressure. So that little bit, even though it's a simple little test, tells you a whole lot about the whole cardiovascular system and how it's working. All right? So very, very important uh, tool for you to learn how to do that. All right, jug refill is another one, and I can't believe that my videos are not working here. Um, so jug refill, um, you can see on the horse, I'll just show you this, see this? groove right down here, All right? That's called the jugular groove, and if any of you have had the vet over to take a blood or, or give an injection into the bloodstream, all right, it's that jugular groove. We have one too, so if you turn your neck to the side, you can feel exactly where your jug, jugular vein is right along there, All right? So what we do with horses, this one is particularly, particularly useful for exercising horses that have been out doing more extreme work. But what we do is I would actually put my thumb right on the top part of that jugular vein and I'd push it down and then I'd press in. And what I'm looking for there is the fill of blood as it goes back up. So you can try this at home, although in this kind of weather with fuzzy coats, you're not gonna be able to see it very well. But essentially you press here, bring it down, and then you count as the blood fills back up. And again, it's one other measure of the cardiovascular system. It works great in the summertime. You can really see it because if your horse is sweating, it's a lot more uh, easy to see it as a visible. But if you're counting 1,001, 1,002, 1,003 as it's filling up, then that's a problem with the horse. All right, skin pinch. Everybody hold your hand out. I told you, you can't sit here and do nothing. Take your thumb and forefinger. And I want you to pinch a little bit of skin on the back of your other hand, twist it just a bit, and then let it go. Is it staying up on anybody? You've had too much coffee this morning. <laughs> All right, this is a little measure of dehydration. So when you pull it up and you twist it, the amount of water in that skin is going to give it its elasticity, and it'll snap back. If that water is missing, then it's going to go back slowly. So we'll get what we call a tenting effect. It stays up in that little tent. And this is something that you can do right at the point of the shoulder. All right, so right in this area here, you just take a little pinch of skin, pull it up, twist it just a little bit, and then let go. And it should snap right back. If it doesn't snap right back, and it takes about two to three seconds, so I pull this up and I go 1,001, 1,002, 1,000, I have a horse that's got some dehydration there. So we have to be careful, particularly if we're out riding, doing prolonged exercise. If you're out at a campground doing uh, riding for the whole day, you need to make sure that that horse is going to get more water into them and drink before you continue on with your exercise. All right? If you do this and it stays up, completely up, then that's a horse that's severely dehydrated and you need to stop what it is you're doing and make sure that you get some hydration. Because hydration is also linked to not only a whole bunch of metabolic things, but what am I talking about this afternoon? Your guts, colic, all right? Guarantee, the more dehydration your horse has, the greater your risk of colic in your horses, all right? So this is a very quick little tool that you can do. Even if you're riding the horse, you can just bend down and do that on the shoulder if you're out riding for the day. So very, very quick little tool to do. Heart rate. Oh, oh, you get the two one. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Okay, so I need a third person up here so they can listen to your heart. <laughs> All right, these are stethoscopes. Now, everybody knows that if you go to the doctor, whoops, I need that one, you have that one. All right, that they keep this in the refrigerator, right? 
That's on page one of the manual. So on a horse, we don't have to worry about it being too cold. So what you're going to do with that, how many of you have a stethoscope in your barn right now? Oh, excellent. Okay, you guys get a gold star because that's one of the highest responses. I've, must be a lot of endurance riders in here. Mm. <laughs> All right. The heart rate, or sorry, the stethoscope, you can get very uh, cost efficiently through your veterinarian. And it is an absolute great tool for helping to get past that ADR and the EDPP level. Because what we're going to do with this is two things. One, we're going to listen to the heart. The other thing, we can listen to the breathing, but also we're going to learn how to listen to the guts. So um, put, for those who have one of these stethoscopes and you want to try it out, just put it in your ears. Make sure you always hang on to this part of it, because I can tell you if it swings and hits your belt buckle, you're really in trouble. So then you lean forward and so that those are properly seated into your ears, and you can then place it, and you see where I have it on the horse there? It's right below, right behind the, um, the elbow of the horse. So you find the ribs underneath, we press that up, and then you start to count, all right? And you should count for about 15 seconds. So if you've got a digital watch, make sure you use that. And count zero, the very first one, count zero, all right? And then you count the rest of them. Now, what sound are we listening for? Very good, lub-dub, all right? It's a two-beat sound. So you hear lub-dub, lub-dub, Lub dub, right? That is the sound that you're listening for. And when we're counting that, by the way, it's not one, two, three, four, five, six. It's lub dub is one, lub dub is two, lub dub is three. And count that for 15 seconds. And when you multiply that by four, you should get a resting heart rate of 25 to 40. What's a human rest, resting heart rate? 60, 70, 80 for the couch potatoes, all right? The, the more fit you are, the lower your heart rate is. It's the same thing in horses, all right? So if you've got a, a low heart rate, then that's a really good sign, all right? Okay, um, if that stays up after exercise, are you going to give me a 10-minute warning? Just to say, you oh. want to hook up your hard drive, maybe they'll work on if you have your hard drive attached. If there's time, because, yeah, some of the videos in here, are, especially the lameness one, is useful. Um, okay, because my computer, though, will take a while to boot up is the problem. They should have been, yeah, although that should have covered with yours. But let's try it then. We can, yeah, because there's some videos in here that, um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry for the technical issues here. You're not hearing anything? <laughs> she has no heart. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and then it should be. And let's see if that's going to work. It should be. Let's see if it is. No, they didn't transfer over. Darn. No, good. it was a good try. Thank you. All right, so let's move on here. All right, so that was the heart rate. So 25 to 40 beats per minute. Now, here's an interesting little thing. If you know your horse's heart rate because you've been doing it regularly, and then you come in one morning and you check the heart rate, heart rates for many horses will start to go up two and even three days 
before there's an obvious problem. So with some respiratory issues, we've watched horses that that heart rate just starts to go up a little bit, even before they're with a snotty nose or any other sign. So if you know your horse and you know that resting heart rate, that's why they recommend doing a resting heart rate on a daily basis, um, particularly if you're in a stable with other horses, because you can pick up problems days before you'll actually see it. And we all know the earlier you can pick up a problem, the better it is for the horse and the vet bill. All right, now, if that heart rate stays up, though, so let's say we're out walk or trotting your horse, or you're conditioning your horse, you're doing, uh, whether it's cross-country schooling or driving or trail riding, and you do the heart rate at the end of the exercise, depending on the exercise, it may be at higher levels. So horses' heart rates can actually go up to 220 or 240 beats per minute. What's the maximum of a human? 220 minus your age. All right, so horses' heart rates go from this very, very low 25 to 40 and can go all the way up to 220, even 240. Well, that's what makes them such a great athlete. So again, that heart, though, is a very good predictor of what's going on in the body. So if there's stress going on, we're going to see it in the heart rate. And so if that heart rate stays elevated for more than 10 minutes after you've finished, that's a horse that's still very fatigued and very tired. And when that horse comes in, if it's still over 68 beats in, an, in a minute, after 30 minutes of rest, there's something going on. That's a red flag. You need to take a look at it. It could be a bunch of th different things. The horse could not feel well. It could be in pain. It could be dehydration. It could be a bunch of different things. So the purpose of this is not to diagnose a problem. It's to alert you to a problem. All right? So that's one of the things to keep in mind about heart rates. Gut sounds. So, the next thing that we can do with this stethoscope, if you have your handy-dandy stethoscope in your, in your barn, is if you see your horse looking a little punk, and he's not eating, or he's just not um, doing well, you can take this stethoscope and you can actually listen to the gut sounds. And the way you listen to the gut sounds, again, is you put these in your ears, and you press the flat part on the abdomen of the horse. Now, on the horse that's in my picture, I'm going to listen up here, and then I'm going to listen down underneath, and be careful doing that the first time. Keep your kneecaps out of the way. All right, the horse has to be used to you putting that stethoscope down there, so just a safety message. But you listen up here, and then you put it down below, and what you're listening for are bubbles and gurgles. So everybody knows what your stomach does before lunchtime? All right, we all hear that bubble and gurgle. And if you really want to do this, put your ear on your dog, because you can hear all kinds of bubbles and gurgles going through your dog. All right, but that's what you want to hear is bubbles and gurgles. So it sounds like water running through a brook or, or just bubbling or gurgling along, right? And what you're actually listening to is the fluid as it makes its way down through the intestinal tract. And that's a really, really important thing for a horse to have that fluid going down through that intestinal tract. We'll talk a little bit more about that this afternoon. But if you listen, you should hear roughly every six to 10 seconds some gurgling. Right? And that's what we call, anyone know the, what we're listening to there? Starts with a P, peristalsis. All right, so that's that muscular contraction that actually pushes that fluid down through that huge long gut of the horse. So every six to 10 seconds, you hear bubbling, gurgling, and that means that water is flowing. When we have horses that have been overstressed, heat stress, um, in pain, uh, if they're really, really fatigued, or if we've got colic issues going on, you will put your stethoscope there and you may hear nothing. And that's scary. Or you may hear constant bubbling and gurgling with no break at all. And that's an overactive gut. Or another sound you might hear is close your eyes for a minute and I want you to think with me, if you're standing in a big cave and you hear water dripping, so you hear bloop, 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 right? That's a problem too, because that might mean that part of the gut is inflated, right, with gas, and those are drips of water going through. So those are all bad sounds. So you can learn how to do that. So the next time your vet's out with you, um, work with your veterinarian and have them help you with learning gut sounds. Right, because we should be able to hear those roughly every six to 10 seconds. All right, respiratory rate. The easiest way to look at respiratory rate is by watching the flank. Okay, 
Now we're on camera, I hate to do this, but I'm a horse. <laughs> what you're looking for is the movement of the belly and the rib cage. So that, what we should be seeing there is that rib cage going out and then back in. Out and then back in. All right? And so each time it goes out and back in, that's one breath. And so horses, generally speaking, if they're relaxed and just hanging out, they're going to breathe about 12 to 15 breaths per minute. And that's normal. And we don't want to see them working at it. We don't want to hear any noises when they're breathing. And we don't want to see any double flank movements. All right, so anyone seen a horse with heaves? All right, so we've seen that before. And unfortunately, I'll warn you on this, folks, by March, we're going to have a lot of horses with heaves. So take care of your hay supply. Make sure the dust is down because we had such a crappy weather trying to get hay off. By March, we're going to have a lot of horses um, that have heaves if we're not careful of the hay. All right, so we should see it relaxed. We should see it regular. We shouldn't see that double flank movement that indicates that the horse has a, a heave or some respiratory issue. And we shouldn't see the horse panting. And by panting, what I'm talking about, everybody knows the black lab picture, all right, with the tongue hanging out and he's, <laughs> all right. Um, but what we do with horses is we'll see nostrils flaring. So if we see the nostrils flaring back and forth, that's a sign that they're panting. And that can be a sign of heat stress, all right. And then, as I said, if it's labored or abnormal, then that's a problem. How many have magic fingers? I want you to learn how to have magic fingers because you should know your horse's legs so well that as Dr. Art King has challenged all of us, if I blindfolded you and had you identify your horse in a string of 10 just by feeling their legs, how many of you could do it? Kind of an interesting concept though, isn't it? You know all the bumps, the nooks, and the crannies on your horse's legs so well that if anything's different, you're going to feel them. So if you feel anything abnormal, and this is such an easy thing to do, every time you're grooming your horse, before you get on your horse, just run your hands down the legs. You're looking for any heat, you're looking for any swelling, you're looking for one leg that's hotter than the other, or a hoof that's hotter than the other, and your fingers can pick that up for you if you train yourself to notice that. All right? And obviously if it's painful, raw, or bleeding, um, then that's something that requires some veterinary assistance. Obviously, take a look at the whole horse, wounds, saddle, girth, so we don't want to see any blood, we don't want to see swelling. The other thing we don't want to see is horses guarding. How many have seen that? Guarding? So if you go to where the hawk is swollen, the horse is pulling away, right? Because they're trying to protect themselves. And so you don't want to see that with your horse, because that's a real sign that there's a problem. Muscles and back. Now again, I'm sorry that this video is not working. But pretend I have a horse in front of me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my fingers on the withers of the horse, and I'm going to press all the way along the back of the horse. And then I'm going to run my hand down on the girth line, or harness, if you've got a horse in harness. Um, you should run your hand around where the britching and everything else is. And then you do it on the other side. And what you're going to see with these horses, if they have a back problem, is as I go down that back and I'm pressing, the ears are going to be pinned back. The head may jerk up. I may see some contraction in the back. They may even try and bite you. How many of you have seen a, a girthy horse? Is that a true reflection of what's going on? Probably not. All right. Most of those cases, that horse has got a back issue or something going on there. So if you see a horse that you put the saddle on and they're pinning their ears or they're protecting themselves or they're dropping down, a horse with a lumbar problem, I can actually put them on the ground because it just drops them so quickly, all right? And so we'll see that with certain breeds of horses. Um, so what you're going to do, and I want you to take your two fingers, and I want you to press them together in front of you, but I want you to pretend there's a marshmallow between your fingers. And what you're going to do is press just hard enough that you're compressing the marshmallow. You're not putting your fingers through the marshmallow, all right? So that's the amount of pressure that you're going to use as you go along the back of the horse or along the girth line. And if they have a problem, they will show you. All right, so again, it's picking up those subtle cues that the horse is telling us. And they may stand there and show you absolutely nothing until you do that. And if you've gone for a long trail ride, do this the next morning. 
because that will really show you whether you've got an ongoing problem with that horse. All right? And again, if you do, if it's tight and it's tender, you need to actually take steps to remedy, remedy that. All right, anal tone. Usually I do this one after lunch. <laughs> now, by anal tone, what I'm talking about is that sphincter. Everybody knows what their anus is. All right, hope you don't get called one, but you know what it is. And so it's a muscular sphincter at the very end of the digestive tract. And it should be closed and it should be tight. And if anyone's brushing back there, you know that the horse typically clamps their tail. Or if you touch this, it constricts. And that's normal. It's supposed to do that. Right? So the thing is, with horses that are exhausted or if they're highly heat stressed or various other issues that can be going on, sometimes what you'll see is when you tap that, it just kind of slowly closes up. It gets a bit lazy. It doesn't just clamp shut. And so that's another test of the horse health check that you can look at. All right, rectal temperature. Anybody know the difference between a rectal and an oral thermometer? <laughs> the taste. <laughs> so make sure that you buy one and label it for the horse <laughs> and that no one else uses it for the kids. So the rectal th thermometer on a horse is actually quite important um, because, again, on a kid, you feel the forehead, right? Um, it's real easy to do. On a horse, it's hard to pick up fever unless you've got a rectal thermometer. So we should have a rectal thermometer that's 37 to 38 degrees roughly at, at rest. It is going to go up with exercise, but it should also go back down. All right, so again, after exercise, um, this should continue to go down. But if you are out riding your horse and it's a really hot, in particular, humid day, having a rectal thermometer along with you, just tucked in your pocket, can be very helpful to assess your horse if something's going on. So if that temperature is 39 to less than 40 during the ride, all right, you may be working your horse or trotting down the trail or doing eventing or something like that. But if it starts to go 40 or higher, that's a dangerous situation because the core temperature is hotter than the rectal temperature. Anyone have eggs for breakfast this morning? Okay, what happens when you fry an egg? The egg white goes white because you've cooked it, you've destroyed the protein. That happens at just over 40 degrees. Hmm, all right? So that's one of the problems. When we have a horse that's been exercising too hard or can't cope with the heat and humidity, um, their body temperature goes too high and we can actually cause muscle damage because the protein actually gets cooked, if you will, um, from that overheating. So again, learning how to use the rectal thermometer, really, really important, all right? Get your vet to tell you how to do it. All right, so when you have, the next time you have the veterinarian there, uh, get yourself a, a rectal thermometer. I recommend the digital ones, not the glass ones. Um, for one, they don't get sucked into the back end as easily because they've got a little wider thing. Um, and also with the digital readout makes it really quick for you to, to see what the temperature is. So again, that's something else I encourage all of you to buy. Um, and then we should have impulsion. Okay, what I want you to picture there is this horse bouncing and dancing all over the, the field. So he's showing you lots of impulsion. And of course, we want to see that with horse. That's normal uh, for a horse to have lots of impulsion and bouncing around. Um, if they're stumbling, if they're short striding, all right, those are all problems uh, that we have. Stiffness, limping. How many of you have ever gone on a long ride out on a trail or done some hard eventing work or endurance work? and watch the first four steps of your horse out of the stall the next morning. Couple of you, very good, all right? Because those first few steps out of the stall the following morning after the workout can tell you how hard you worked your horse. So we wanna see them moving freely and getting out there, right? If you start to see stiffness every time you're, you're overworking your horse, that can start to develop into problems over time. All right, so it's something I want you to train your eyes to take a look at because that horse should be trotting uh, freely. Uh, again, now I apologize because I don't have these. Um, the gait of the horse should be rhythmic, right? So we should hear clip, clop, clip, clop. When we have a gait change, what's the first thing you're wanting to train your eye to identify? Head bob. All right, really, really important for you to train your eyes for a head bob because minor little lamenesses, you'll see a little bit, all right? Obviously, the big lamenesses, you're going to see a lot of head bob on that, 
All right, and so the more that you can train your eye to watch that. If you're just learning how to do this, trot your horse in a riding arena along the wall or a barn where there's a difference in color because um, what really, really works well is if you have a line for comparison and you trot your horse by it, you actually get to see that head bob a lot better. So if you're not sure, it's a little trick that you can try and put them against something solid and you can then watch the head relative to that. If there's a head bob, there's something going on there, right? So you need to take, uh, pay attention to what's going on. And if there's a real head bob and it's consistent, again, that's one of those situations where there's something really wrong and we need to get the vet out for you to talk to them and assess the horse. All right, attitude, that's the EDPP, so they should be eating, drinking, peeping, peeing and pooing. Um, they should not be de depressed or lethargic. Um, they shouldn't be not interested in their world. Think of this, it's a prey animal and he's not interested in his surroundings. What's that signify? All right, that's, horses just don't do that. So if they're just standing there and it's highly unusual for them, that can be a problem. So we want to make sure that uh, we can pick that stuff up. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. Okay, I'm going to go back here and do one other thing. So how do we work on this? So we have the green, the yellow, and we have the... There we go. All right. So as I said, we have the, the red, we have the yellow, and we have the green. So somebody give me an idea of something you might see after a trail ride. Sue, I'm going to pick on you. A mild day, new horses coming out to a trail ride. On that horse health check, what things are you likely to see? Come on. Mucous membranes are going to be... Okay, um, so... Um, I was thinking more overweight horses. No, I'll just talk about signs. yeah. No, okay. So for sure, mucous membranes mm -hmm. might be little, little um, uh, pale in color. Okay. Um, perhaps a little sticky. Yep. Uh, what are we going to hear with the heart rate? What's going to happen with that? Heart rate uh, slightly elevated. Okay, so it's not coming down. So we've got two yellows there. What do you think is this is indicating? Something, all right? So remember, this isn't a diagnostic tool, we're, but we, something is not normal. And probably, yeah, um, we're going to have something like skin pinch that goes along with it as well. That would be a, a typical thing that we would see on horses that have been out on trail rides. So what's this mean? You're picking up... Right? So there's a yellow there. It's not normal. So stop what you're doing, take a closer look at what's going on and see if you can't figure out what's going on. Um, now let's go back to this. Let's say you go out there and the horse hasn't been eating and drinking. All right, so the attitude all right, is very dull and you listen for those gut sounds and you're not hearing any. You better call the vet, all right, because that is potentially, we've got a real problem there. Now let me tell you a very quick story this isn't a complicated thing. You can do this horse health check in two minutes or less. All right, so if you do walk in there and you see the horse ADR, it doesn't mean you have to immediately get on the phone to the vet, but what you should do is do this horse health check and write down the parameters, write things down that you're seeing. And what you've been given out very kindly from the organizers is one of the horse health check articles. And you'll see on that there's a page at the back that shows you all of those parameters on how to look at them. And so record those and call your veterinarian if you've got yellows, if you've got several yellows, and especially if you've got reds, call your vet and talk to them. Say, this is what I'm seeing today, here's what I'm observing. And a very quick story, even kids can do this effectively. Because one of my students called me up one day and told me that we had just learned the horse health check in one of our online courses. She in turn was teaching it to the kids in her barn. Her 10-year-old daughter was taking care of the uh, noon feeding for the horses, and she went in, and one of the horses ain't doing right. So she goes to the tack room. She picks up her little horse health check. She has her stethoscope and her rectal thermometer, and she goes through the whole horse, and she writes it all down. And she calls up the vet and says, Dr. So-and-so, I think I need you out here. I have a horse that's in trouble. 
And he said, well, is there a parent around or an adult around that I can talk to? No, I'm the one doing the feeding. But the heart rate is 52. The gut sounds are absent. The skin pinch is elevated. And he goes, I'll be right there. So it was a colic. The vet was able to get things organized. And he turned to her and he goes, young lady, you may have just saved that horse's life. Because we know colics can go south in a hurry. So that's the moral of the story. If you think it's complicated, don't. All right, think again. Because literally, when we train people, they get to do this in two minutes or less. It's very, very quick to do. So I encourage you to read that. Um, I encourage you to go home and practice. All right, everybody go home and you practice. I want you to listen to resting heart rates and gut sounds five days in a row on your horses and record the results so that you know what's normal for your horse. And in this way, you can pick up what's not normal and you can get the proper veterinary care that you need. Thank you. Is there any questions? questions yeah. yeah, okay. Just raise your hand and I'll come running. <laughs> if you could stand. Sure. Hi, Gail. Um, yeah. I was, thank you very much for the presentation. Really interesting stuff. Just wondering, um, I'm intrigued about that slide that showed the uh, different um, opportunities to see whether uh, the horse health was the red... Um, the amber, or amber color and the green. You just showed like a, a data program. Is that available anywhere? No, um, that's what we use in our courses, uh, but we don't actually have that. Now, there is an app for that. <laughs> so um, we actually have that whole horse health check done as an app. You can get it on, on Google or, or Apple. Um, and there's a free version and then there's an upgraded version if you want to record things. Uh, so, yes, we, we don't have it in this version for, for um, out there in the market, but we do have an app. So it's the Horse Health Tracker. I've got little cards over there if anyone wants to learn more about it. But it's a great teaching tool um, because if you get the one upgrade, which I think is like $3.99 or something, it also shows you how to do all of those with the videos that weren't working on this one today, uh, as well as learning how to weigh your horse, like take weight tapes and um, to measure your horse. And then there's also a section on body condition scoring. And the next grade up, you can have like, I think it's 10 or more horses, and you can chart that for all your horses over the year and give yourself reminders uh, when the farriers to come, when vaccinations are due. So, um, yeah, we don't have that particular one, but we do have the app, and there is a free version of it. I have a question over here. Yep. At one point, you mentioned something about, about I think, when you were talking about the lumbar, uh, various breeds. What breeds were you meaning? Um, oftentimes, trotters. We'll, we'll see a lot more in the lumbar, just because of the rotational action of the, of the joint. So, particularly racehorses that are trotters. Um, you can often pick that up in, in some of them. Yep. Any other um, I'm just curious about a horse's mental health too and how mm -hmm. do you gauge that? That's an excellent question. And we are still, I guess I would say the science is very young on that um, because for equine behaviorists, we don't want to be anthropomorphic because actually if we're trying to put our own values on the horse, we're not doing them any favor. So to say, well, I don't like being out in the rain, so I'm not going to put my horse out in the rain um, is not the proper way. But the new evidence coming out from any of the equine behavioral studies is showing that indeed horses do have an emotional life. That's not surprising to any of us who've lived with horses or lived with dogs. All right, we all know when the dog's disappointed because we didn't take them out for a walk. All right, sorry, I usually use the W word in my house. I can't actually say walk. Um, but there's a lot more research now that's going on looking at horse behavior and the impact of horse behavior and changes to the horse. And so not surprisingly, we are getting more research done showing that yes, these horses have a very complex emotional life. That shouldn't be surprising because of the social herd that they have. Horses are very, very social animals and they are masters at reading body language. That shouldn't be surprising either. 
All right, so again, those are some of the lessons that I really encourage people. If you are a student of the horse, continue learning in in that area as well because some of the stuff that's coming out will blow your mind. Really, really neat information coming out on that. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Where can you find that information? Uh, Well, the easiest way um, is the International Society for Equestrian Science. Or there's some excellent books out there. Um, Paul McGreevy is um, one of the authors of equine behavior. Uh, There's some equine welfare textbooks out there. Uh, Read stuff by Temple Grandin. Um, Read stuff by um, David Miller out of the UK. Um, There's some great books. And if you want to email me afterwards, I can help supply some more resources for you because... Um, It is a new and um, just really, really exciting area of research that's going on, and a lot more information is coming out about it. (laughs) Um, Right now, you see a lot of people debating about putting their horses out right now. Mm -hmm. Mine would rip the barn down if I didn't put them out. But what what are the signs of a horse that's actually cold besides standing, shivering, Stuff like that. Yeah, so that's a good question because given the weather right now, as I was driving up here, I was looking at what people were doing with their horses. Um, so, for example, I've had a quarter horse mare who's very solid and bulky, and she has a wonderful winter coat on her, and I don't worry about her until it gets to minus 30 because she's never shown me any signs at all. Um, whereas if you've got a thin skinned thoroughbred, that's a whole different ball game, all right? So what you're looking for there are horses that are shivering, are horses that have a sudden increase in appetite and increase in water. So um, you're, you're looking at both their forage intake and the water intake. Uh, you're looking at horses that huddle together. You're looking at horses that are trying to get out of the, the uh, wind. But essentially, if the horse has good body condition score on them, and by that I mean a six, Um, they've got a good hair coat, and they're a thicker-skinned or muscled horse, if they can get out of the wet, the cold, and the wind, that's your triad, right? then a lot of those horses will be fine with extra hay and lots of water. And if any of you are feeding in hay nets right now, think about putting the hay out on the ground. Right? We know that we lose some of it that way, but so what? You lose 15%. But the horses need to consume more hay during this cold water, and they can't get enough from a hay net. So in particular, if you see a horse that's losing weight, you sure don't want to see them going down at this time of year. Absolutely not. If you have a horse that's going into the winter at a four or less on a body condition score, so you can see the last three ribs or more, or if they're slopey in the, in the rump or you're seeing hollows in the wither, um, those are horses that need probably extra blanketing and they are also going to need extra food. All horses need extra food in this kind of weather, all of them, and water. So remember, both. And if anyone in here says, let them eat snow, I'm going to take you out the back and pummel you because I hear this a lot of times that, oh, there's lots of snow out there, we'll just let them eat the snow. Absolutely not. And I've had that discussion when we were part of the committee working on the code of practice that was looking at this. And they said, well, where's the proof that horses left out on snow are going to get dehydrated and die? And I said, the wolves ate it. (laughs) Because if we give a horse enough snow for its water needs for a day, do you know how much snow that is? Think of an entire football field with three inches of snow and the horse would have to hoover that up every single day. Jeez. Now, what's that do to their body temperature? Is that what we want? No, no. Right? So, yes, horses can use some snow for water, but how many of our pastures aren't covered with the yellow stuff? Hmm. All right? So... Pristine, lovely snow, can horses get some water out of that? Yes, they can, but not without having some issues. Progressively, over time, that horse is going to get more and more dehydrated. And the more and more dehydrated they get, what are we risking? And we wonder why we have high colics in the wintertime, right? So, preferably water with some heat in it. Don't let your water freeze. Loose hay when it's really cold like this. Blanket as necessary. And another pet peeve of mine is there's blankets on horses that were for the minus 30 wind chill from last night, and by 5 o'clock today, we're supposed to have like minus 5 mm-hmm. warm spell, and they'll still have those blankets on. 
Now, if you guys had to live in your winter coats all day, whether you're inside, outside, or in bed, would you be happy? All right? So if we're going to blanket horses, we must monitor the heat of the horse under that blanket and put blankets on or off as needed. All right, that's another of my soapboxes. Sorry. Sorry. Last question. I, I just have a question about blanketing and, and the controversy of it. Mm -hmm. You hear so often people say, oh, horses have lived in the wild forever and they've never needed blankets. I had a horse come to me um, from somebody else that I didn't know, like I didn't know the history of him. Mm -hmm. And in November, when we had that wet, cold weather, and he had shelter, and free choice hay mm -hmm. and heated water, he just was shivering from yeah. head to toe. Right. And um, in his big quarter horse, and he wasn't underweight, but um, so I said to the owner, we really need to look at a blanket, and there's like there's this controversy of, well, if you just let them get cold, they'll their bodies will adjust, or they'll build a winter coat, or at some point, and it's like, when do you say, okay, they're struggling, and it's not fair, and the horse is actually gonna be compromised, and I just yep. was wondering, like, is there some truth that some horses just can't handle the cold? Absolutely. Like, when people absolutely need, like, a horse there is. is not always just a horse. Yep. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Just like any of us in this room. If I gave one coat to every one of you and sent you outside, some of you would be fine and others would be cold. All right, so horses are the same. And if a horse is standing there shivering, all right, the problem is we, when we talk about, okay, horses have survived for 55 million years and we didn't put blankets on them. Right? That's fair to talk about the species, but we didn't lock them in a stall in a barn that was minus 35 and prevent them from moving, which allows them to get warm. We didn't isolate them so that they couldn't cuddle up with everybody else in the herd and stay warm. We don't give them shelter or areas to get out of the, the heat. Wild horses, if you watch wild horse behavior, and I encourage you to learn about that because it helps us to make those decisions on domestic horses, they will find valleys that are out of the wind. They will herd together when underneath the trees so it's got a little bit of a canopy. So if you watch their behavior, you will see a lot of heat-seeking behavior with herds. And they learn certain horses get to the center and other horses don't, all right? And they'll change too. You'll see them change um, positions in wild horse herds. So all really interesting stuff and a very good question. They all have to be treated differently. Yep. Okay. Okay. <laughs>